Our scripture passage this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, and I'm going to be reading from uh, chapter 1, verses 16 to 20. Chapter 1, 16 to 20. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. God, we pray that you would guide us in the moments that follow as we think about the words that you have given to us in the Holy Scriptures, that we would have clear understanding, that your Holy Spirit would open our minds and hearts to the truth you have for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why am I a Christian? Well, thank you for asking. I appreciate that, uh, that thought. And I'll, uh, I'll tell you, the reason that I'm a Christian is not because it's my tradition uh, or that I grew up in the church and it's just what uh, was expected of me, although I did grow up in the church and it was expected of me. But in my teens, I gave up on the church. I stopped attending church. I stopped having any uh, affiliation with Christianity and in fact for a number of years did not even believe in God. And so I don't have a, uh, a tradition that I feel obligated to be a Christian. Uh, it's there in my past, but it's not enough that that by itself would make me want to be a Christian. So why am I a Christian? Well, I can give you a one word answer and it's the Sunday school answer. Jesus. Jesus is the reason that I am a Christian. All the other things, the, uh, the loyalty to the church, uh, a love of the scriptures, all of the other things that go along with Christianity, for me, flow out of my faith in Jesus Christ. And so, if that's the case, if Jesus is the reason for everything, if Jesus is the core and the foundation, that's where we need to put our focus. And I would say that there are two questions that are the most important questions for us to ask as individuals. One is, who is Jesus? And secondly, what does Jesus want from us. Now, the who part is something that we have been looking at for the last year or so in various sermons, but in case you need a refresher, what we've been saying is that Jesus is God come into the world, that he was fully God and fully human. He wasn't God pretending to be human. He was God fully human. He had a body just like ours. Uh, he would have to uh, eat and to drink and to sleep and to rest. Uh, he had a job. He had family. He had friends. And he experienced a lot of the things that we experience in life as well. But that wasn't all there was to him. He was indeed God. And the scriptures tell us that all things were created through Christ. And it's because he's fully God and fully human that he's able to bridge the way between us and the Father. So that's who Jesus is. And that's a pretty remarkable identity to have. And if that's true, then that second question becomes even more important. What does Jesus want from us? 
Well, some people might say, well, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? We've known that for a long time. What Jesus wants is for us to have faith. He wants us to believe. That's, that's it. And part of that emphasis really came about through the Reformation, uh, the Protestant Reformation from 500 years ago, when Martin Luther, he struggled in trying to be good enough for God. He struggled with that. He would do everything he could to try to please God, and he felt like he never was able to achieve that point where he had earned God's love. And he he rediscovered in the scriptures the concept of living by faith. And because of that, uh, he pushed back against all the things that we're supposed to do and focused on faith alone. But even Martin Luther understood that once we become children of God through faith, that the Father expects something from us, uh, that there is such a thing as a Christian life. And it's something that we need to be aware of. And so that's what we're going to be doing over the next number of weeks. We're going to be looking at what does Jesus want. You might remember the campaign from a number of decades ago, the WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, we're going to do the WDJW. Uh, We're not going to be handing out uh, bracelets, sorry. Uh, But we're going to be looking at what does Jesus want? And we're going to go through a whole bunch of different things that we find in the Gospels because we are in a really good place to understand what Jesus wants for us because we have four biographies, four Gospels in our New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to be looking at each of them to try to understand what Jesus wants. And so we're going to start with looking at this really interesting passage where Jesus walks along and calls some of his first disciples. Now, I was always intrigued by this story when I heard it, and I, I, remember, I don't remember a lot of my time listening to sermons as a, as a young person, but uh, for some reason, the, the part about when Jesus sees these fishermen and he says, from now on, uh, you're going to be fishers of people, or when I uh, heard it, uh, fishers of men, um, and I thought, wow, that's kind of clever how Jesus does that to, to make that connection. And it is a, a great part of it, but we're not going to focus so much on that part as what I think is the, the main intent of what is going on here. And so to do that, we're just going to try to put ourselves in this place, try to imagine that we're there at the Sea of Galilee, uh, that we're seeing all these different fishermen around and we're uh, imagining Jesus coming along and striking up a conversation, if you could call it a conversation. So we start off with Simon and Andrew. Simon, uh, we uh, later come to know him as Peter, as he receives a new name. I hope Simon didn't have a bunch of business cards uh, made right before then, because that would have been very unfortunate. But we have Simon and Andrew. They are fishermen. And fishermen, there are... Uh, these are kind of working class people, but not uh, don't think of them as being uh, rich, but don't think of them as being poor either. So these are not just hired workers. They have their own business in which they are fishing. And so they are living a hardworking, but relatively comfortable life for that time and that place. And life is not too bad for them. And, uh, and we also know that uh, at least Simon has a wife. Uh, we, uh, we meet her a little bit later in the first chapter. And uh, so he has a family. Maybe he had children. We don't know any of that information. Uh, but we do know that he has a wife. And so this is the situation which Simon and Andrew find themselves. And they're out fishing. They're doing their job. They're, it was another day. Uh, they're not expecting anything, to, anything special to happen. And Jesus comes along and says to, him, uh, says to them, follow me. And they follow. Now, we could, uh, we could reflect on, on uh, other passages and, and, and potential other conversations that had happened and encounters with Jesus. 
But I think Mark really wants us to get a sense of the suddenness and the how radical this call is and how radical their response. There they are. They have uh, a good living. Uh, they have family. And Jesus says, follow me. And they do it. Now, there's a cost to that. They are losing their livelihood there. Probably the equipment that they have is something that is worth money. We don't see that they are taking the time to, uh, to sell it first or anything else like that. They are just leaving and following Jesus. Uh, we don't know the full situation of what the, the, how the relationship dynamic worked with Simon and his wife. Uh, I do find it interesting that one of Jesus' first miracles is to heal Simon's mother-in-law, which I think really, really helped uh, the situation. Uh, But we find out later on in Paul's letters that uh, uh, Simon, as he was uh, known as Peter, um, later on in the early church, uh, that his wife traveled along with him. So there was was, uh, still some relationship going on, but it must have been a very awkward, difficult situation. And yet they chose to follow. But Jesus wasn't done. There was two more fishermen, uh, another pair of brothers, James and John. In fact, if you look at this passage, you might wonder, like, why are both of these shared? Like, didn't we get the message the first time? We got a pair of brothers. We have two brothers and they're fishermen. And Jesus says, come follow me. And they follow. So we got the point with Simon and Andrew. Why do we need to hear about it from James and John? Well, part of it in ancient writing, telling something twice or or sharing two examples of the same principle was a way of getting the reader's attention. It was shaking them and saying, listen, you really need to pay attention right now. I am repeating myself for a reason. Now, not to say that uh, there, it's just a repeat. They are two different situations, but they are telling the same kind of story. And so we're supposed to pay attention to this. We're supposed, you can imagine a highlighter or an asterisk or underline going here that this is something that is really important. And it's not just repeating what happened with Simon and Andrew. There's a little bit that is different. We see that perhaps the... Um, their business was a little bit bigger because it talks about having hired men who are helping out. We also find that their father Zebedee is the one that they are working for. And so when they're leaving their their, uh, fishing business, they're also leaving their father. Now that's not to say that their relationship was completely ruptured, but it must have been very awkward. I just, uh, I've never been in that situation, but uh, imagine being in a family business and then having to go to your father and say, you know what, uh, we're done. We're actually going to travel with this uh, religious teacher and we're going to just walk around different places and, uh, and preach the gospel. Uh, that would be a little bit awkward, I would suspect. And so this is the story that we are given. And what we're finding here is that both, uh, both sets of brothers, uh, Andrew and Simon, James and John, there's a cost to what they are doing. They are, they are giving up something in terms of their livelihood, and it is also deeply impacting their relationships. And yet they are choosing to do this. Do they know everything? Do they understand what the next couple of years are going to look like? No, they don't have all the answers, but they begin to follow Jesus. So I would like to say that the call to follow is not something unique to these fishermen, but it is something that is relevant for us today. In fact, it's the same call that is given to us today. So when we ask, What does Jesus want? Well, first of all, Jesus wants us to follow him. We are supposed to follow Jesus. And so I could say, um, look at this passage and just do what Andrew, Simon, uh, James, and John do. Just do that exact same thing. Well, 
that's fine, except for there are a few little differences. So when Jesus showed up there at the Sea of Galilee and said, follow me, they knew what to do as first steps. And it was literal first steps. They just took one step and then another step, and they just kept walking as Jesus walked, and they walked in the same direction that Jesus walked. And so it was pretty easy to understand what they were supposed to do, at least at the very beginning. When we tell someone today to follow Jesus, what does that look like? I don't think that you physically see Jesus walking around and then taking a step and and, and walking right behind him. Uh, Most of us don't have that experience. Now, you might say, wait a minute, Steve, you're being a little bit too literal. Uh, When we say follow Jesus, that's not exactly what we mean. And I will admit that I sometimes take things a little bit too literally. I remember as a child, uh, we would... We would say the Lord's Prayer every Sunday in church, and when it would come to the part of uh, forgive us our trespasses, my mind would race like, did I walk on someone's property without permission? I can't remember. Did I do that? Like that was a horrible sin that I needed forgiveness for, and that's obviously not what we mean by trespassing there. And I understand when we say following, uh, we mean something different. And yet I would say, let's not be too quick to give up the idea of this kind of literal following in terms of being where Jesus is. Because in the ancient world and in the situation with these particular fishermen, when they were called to follow, they were called to physically follow. Yes, they were going to follow his teachings. They were going to follow his example. They were going to do all these other things. But they were going to do that through literally following Jesus. And we can do something like that, although it is not exactly the same. We can follow Jesus by reading the Gospels, reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, reading the stories of Jesus. For some people, the Gospels are really just about telling us that Jesus died for us and that that's all there is. And yes, I would never want to, uh, to play down the, the role of the crucifixion and the atonement for our sins And yet those stories of Jesus, his teachings, uh, the way he interacted with people, his miracles, all these other things, they're there for a reason. We are expected to know them. And so we learn about Jesus in that way. And so we spend time with Jesus as we read the scriptures. Uh, We're also told that the Holy Spirit that is given to us as we believe The Holy Spirit helps to reveal Jesus to us. We experience Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are experiencing Jesus right now because we are a part of the church. The church is described as the body of Christ. As we spend time in the church, and not just Brookfield Baptist Church, but in terms of the the body of believers in general that there are, we are spending some time with Jesus. Now, of course, the church is not perfect. We all can think of examples of, of things that have happened that we haven't liked and, and it didn't seem very Christ-like. And yet, even in its imperfection, we see within the church the presence of Christ and Christ being with us. And we are able to follow Jesus by participating in the church. So we can literally follow Jesus, but what about this other concept of of doing what these fishermen did? Well, are we supposed to give up everything? For those of us who are working, do we have to give up our our jobs? Do we have to give up any sense of, of career? Do we have to give up on our families? Do we have to walk away from our loved ones? What, what, what is actually expected of us here? Well, what's being asked of us in terms of following Jesus, it definitely includes a cost that affects all of those aspects of our life. But what it means is Jesus becomes the lens by which we see all of these things. So it's not about just tacking a little bit of Jesus onto the rest of our life, because that's not what 
uh, uh, Simon and Andrew and James and John did. They didn't just say, you know what, uh, we got these great things going on and we're just going to add just a little bit of Jesus and maybe that's going to make things a little bit better. That's not what we are called to do when we follow Jesus. It really, in a way, is about giving up everything, but it's more about giving up control of everything. It's about making Jesus as Lord. And that means Lord of whatever we do during the day, whether it is school or work or 